Gotta sit the crab. Hi, so I'm Sonia. Um, I apologize for the voice. Went on holiday and got cold, which is, I think, standard for me. Um, so I, I was gonna go, I wasn't gonna give, just give a simple update. With Social Environmental Alliance, I thought that there's, um, there's something to the story in Shawnigan that really speaks to a social environmental alliance. And that that idea of the environment being um, a cohesive social force is playing out. And so I wanted to just give a bit of a, a narrative through that lens. And it shouldn't take me that long. And then um, I'm going to show a quick video and then have some questions. And then I'll let Carolyn take over with the mushrooms and the bioremediation. Just a couple of things. My, um, I've been thinking a lot about my influences uh, coming into this issue. And one group that I was with for a long time that some of you might be familiar with is Results Canada. And that's a citizens action group that works on um, encouraging governments to, uh, to bring in the best programs for um, develop, developing countries. So basic education, basic nutrition, health care. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with results. And the model of results was really about empowering citizens, empowering individual citizens to have a voice and to feel like they could make a difference in the world. And so I, I was about 10 years with results. And then we shifted to Citizens Climate Lobby. Same model. You come together once a month. You get informed on, an, on a specific element of the issue. And you write letters. And then once a year, you go and meet with uh, public officials, politicians, and decision makers. And you make your case for what you're trying to do. And so it's a, it's a great citizen empowering uh, model which I think has really informed a lot of how um, I've approached the situation in Shawnigan. And then the last thing is Charles Eisenstein. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's a philosopher that I can really, I, if there's a third element in this, it's really the idea of um, that creating a more beautiful world. And, and how do you do that? How does that? What does that look like in the real world? So, Social Environmental Alliance um, is what I would say is happening in Shawnigan Lake. The catalyst for this has been this very uh, distressing environmental threat that we're facing, which is the threat to our drinking water from a contaminated landfill, coupled with an, a democratic failure. So the combination of uh, industrial uh, efforts or indu you know, a sort of industrial plan and a government that is unresponsive to a community has been the catalyst for creating something very interesting in Shawnigan. So I'm just going to take you a quick narrative. Summer 2012, the application comes in. They come to the community and they say, hey, we've got this big plan. We're going to put 5 million tons of contaminated soil in your watershed, and it's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be butchered gardens. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. And at that point, um, you know, there was about 300, 350 people went out to the, the meeting at Cary Park, and, and all but two of them voiced their opposition, the owner's daughter and the chief of the Malhat at the time. But the overwhelming sense in the community um, was this couldn't happen. There's no way the government will let this happen. There's no way the government will put a contaminated landfill with all of these toxins at the top of our watershed. Governments don't do that in Canada. That doesn't happen in this world. And so at that point, a very small group, and I'm looking at Sheila, <laughs> um, and Steve, and, and there was a very small group of, of people raising the alarm. And signs were made. And, and um, I'd actually just moved into the community at this time. And, you know, the signs with the skeletons and the crossbows. And it, but... Most people thought, this, this isn't going to happen. I don't have to be worried. And then in spring, Easter, I'll never forget this weekend. We went up to Tofino with a family. And on Thursday, before Easter Friday or Good Friday, the government issued the draft permit, spring 2013. And I, I spent the entire weekend with my husband and my kids, and we were just staring at this permit. 
And we couldn't believe this list of toxins, dioxins and furons and benzenes and toluene and hydrocarbons and oh, and it's absolute incredulity that that the government would draw up a document that says these words for something in our watershed. And so then the organizing steps up. And so that social fabric starts to grow. And I was a teacher then, and so I, I incorporated the results model. I said, we're all going to write letters. And so the whole school where I taught, we all wrote letters. We invited the community in. We did presentations, hundreds and hundreds of letters. I spent uh, a lo the first three days of my spring break faxing these letters to the different offices of the politicians, including Rob Fleming. And then my son came home from Vietnam and he had an appendicitis and I was driving from Jubilee Hospital to General Hospital. I stopped at Rob Fleming's office on the way and said, did you get our letters? <laughs> and he was like, you know, the, the fax list would come in like this. And so we started to work together and there started to be more of us and we started to get some media attention and we started to be just starting to tell the story a little bit. But I think still at that point we thought, they're not, they're, they're not going to go through with this. You know, how could this be possible? End of August, just before Labor Day, 2013, they issue the permit. So the timing on these things is very interesting, right? Right before holidays, right at the end of a news cycle, late in the day. And so appeals were immediately filed to uh, a couple, John and Lois Hayes, and then Rick Saunders, they, they, and Ron Ritherspoon, they all ap filed appeals to the Environmental Appeal Boards. And the SRA, the Shawnigan Residents Association, it started to emerge then as representatives of the community, and they, they filed their appeals and got these fancy lawyers from, uh, we, we are gonna build statues to these lawyers one day, I tell you. <laughs> yes, and the fundraising begins. And so the fabric, the social fabric, grows a bit more and gets a bit more strengthened. And then we get a stay, and so there's a bit of breathing room. Okay, the dumping isn't, there's no dumping. The dumping will never start. And um, so that's, the stay is granted in September, and we wait for March for the hearings to begin. Oh, wait, we got a hearing on stay, remember, on Christmas Eve? Christmas yeah. Eve. Christmas Eve, there we go. Christmas. They said variance on the stay. They said 40,000 pounds on you. That's right. Christmas Eve. And then in March, we get to the Environmental Appeal Board hearings, and they go from March to July. And that, I, that, that fabric is getting stronger and stronger because a bunch of us, including Sheila, are showing up to these hearings and listening and witnessing and learning about what's going on. And um, the media attention starting to grow. We started to th come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. On the last day of the Environmental Appeal Board hearings, uh, about seven or eight of us, including my son, um, <laughs> stood out there on a cold July day. It was surprisingly was so cold. cold in our bathing suits <laughs> with the Save Shawnigan water sign. And so we were starting to figure out how do, how do we generate media attention with uh, you know, a stunt or a gimmick or something. Um, and we raised the profile. And we're getting to know each other in the community more and more, right? August to March 2015, I call this the great lull, the happy period. No decision from the EAB, no dumping, everything was dormant at the site, nothing was happening. We got to turn our attention to other things. We had the annual Shawnigan gathering, uh, which was extraordinary that year. It was actually just days before the permit was issued. We also, I got elected in November and I got to turn my attention to looking to buy Mount Baldy, which we have purchased a 250-acre park that we now own as a community. And so we got, to, we got to put some of that nascent energy, that social bonding that had come out of the threat, and when the threat was removed, even for a short time, we were able to accomplish some pretty significant things as a community. And um, I call I you know, it was the women, it was the ladies of the lake, I call them, that kept making things happen, kept coming together. But this, this sense of um, togetherness was well entrenched. March 20th, 2015, three o'clock in the afternoon, 
the EAB announces its decision that they're going to uphold this permit. And this is when we kicked into high gear. So three days later, we had a, a public meeting, and there were about 350, 400 people showed up with almost no notice. Like, we put notice out Saturday afternoon that there would be a meeting on Monday. We fill up the entire gymnasium. Uh, we start an, another letter writing drive to the provincial government, and we start plans for a rally at the legislature. We get a petition going, and, and these, this kind of organization is starting to really build. And so people are taking on specific tasks, and there's a sense of, you know, how do we keep this machinery moving? But we're not in any way, there's not a huge amount of structure. It's just kind of people step up into the roles that they want to step into. Uh, rallies start happening on the sides of the highway, um, and we start getting an increase in media attention on the issue. Um, I had a note in my notes here to look at the numbers of media hits per month, and I didn't get to that before I got here today, but uh, I think we've had, we are well into the hundreds. We may be nearing a thousand media pieces on this story since March 20th, and that's just been dogged efforts to keep that story alive. The soils start rolling in, but not large, not large quantities. And then in November, we, people in the community start getting phone calls from people in the industry saying, there's this really bad soil coming from Pacific Coast terminals. Um, and, and all sorts of people are getting these calls from people, who, insiders. And so once those soils started rolling in, we had a small number of people who were up on the road basically bearing witness to these truckloads coming in. And that was the first week of November. We blocked them the first day. Huh? Yeah. So I got told to move and the yeah. injunction showed up. Yeah. And then we had Friday the 13th. <laughs> and Friday the 13th, they'd been getting soils for over a week. Um, it's pouring rain and there's a breach, which they say never happened, but it's ironic. Anyways, there's a breach. There's water flowing off the site straight down towards the creek, which goes straight down to Shawnigan Lake. And I go up there with my son at about nine in the morning, and I'm filming it and sending images to the, you know, to the ministries. And um, you actually had check news up there that day <laughs> because of the arrest. Uh, and and they're like, and Jay. Yeah. yeah. And Jay. So we had the arrest happening and the breach happening. And so suddenly there's this, you know, building up of of stuff, and VHA issues what they called a precautionary no-use water advisory, and I thought, good Lord, it's the first time since the beginning of this process that precautionary was actually used by this <laughs> government. There's been nothing precautionary in any of this. That, that no, that no-use water advisory changed everything mm -hmm. because it made it real for people in the community who thought, who who believed, as all of us, I think, grow up in this country believing that the government is going to protect us. And so a large number of people in Shawnigan Lake, up until November 13th, thought, if the government said that this site is okay, it must, it must be okay. And then after November 13th, that shifted. And so suddenly there was an entire community saying, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to touch my water. And there have been people on this lake who have drunk the water <coughs> unfiltered for decades, literally straight out of the lake, straight into your drinking glass, no filter. All there is is just a screen at the end so fish don't get caught up in the <laughs> Yeah, gives goldfish a whole new meaning. So this was devastating. This was a devastating moment for this community that... Um, what had been taken for granted as a given that we could drink our water was gone, just like that. And for those of us that had been involved in pushing back against this permit, I mean, I think we anticipated that. We didn't anticipate it that quickly. So Friday the 13th, the breach, the Beha, 
Monday the 16th is the first time we have this massive protest. There's well over a hundred people up on Stebbings Road. They're stopping the trucks. There's no trucks going by those people. Like they, it was like, no, actually, we're not going to do this. And so suddenly there's faces that, that we've never seen before. And there's relationships again. So that social fabric is getting bigger and it's getting more tightly woven. From then, Right through to December 23rd, there were people up on the road every morning. Mm -hmm. And the stakes kept getting higher. The, the, the company got an injunction, and the police would come, and all sorts of things were going on. People got hauled into court. People got hauled into court. And we had, in the midst of that, on December 8th, another community meeting. This time there was about 450 or 500 people came out, totally packed. I mean, standing room only. Calvin and I, uh, Rose Henry, um, spoke to the, the community. And really, for me, that <coughs> evening was most important to reiterate the message that the only way that we will be successful in this fight is if we are actually kind and compassionate and truthful and loving with each other. And that that has to be the crux of how we do this as a community. And even when we're completely tired of this, and believe me, we're tired of this. <laughs> I want my life back. <laughs> we, we know that we can turn to each other. We know that we have support from each other. And we know that our only task really, is just keep walking towards that sense of truth and right and justice. It's so easy to do. It's so clear. The path is so unbelievably clear and simple. But the problem was the, the, the leaders can only do so much. And, and I think, you know, it there was a sense that there was this sort of growing exhaustion. And so a week later, thanks to a fellow named Gerhard Eichelberger, who came out to that meeting on December 8th, he phones me the next day and he's like, Sonia, I want to help you get organized, right? And so a week later, we have another meeting and about 120 people show up. And this was the meeting to create teams. And so now we have about 14 teams. It's a little fluid. And the teams have specific roles. And so we have a social media team. And that team is really like overseeing the whole social media effort. We have a, uh, we call it visual communication team. That's the photos and the videos. And if you've been watching the Shawnigan story online, you'll see the photos are extraordinary. We have some professional photographers. Um, we have a pair of 75 and 70 year old, 79 year old men who go out every single day and take photos of the site. We have a document of that site from November 13th to today. Every single day, including Christmas. And it's amazing what is in that documentary record. Um, and so with the creation of the teams, it meant that the empowerment of the community, and again, that, that that bond, that social bond, it sort of went up exponentially. So now people could feel like, I can contribute in a way that where my skill set and my interest lies. There's a team leader that's going to give us some direction, and those team leaders are coordinating with a, a kind of central team. Now, it's not a perfect model by any means yet, but it's, we're all willing to keep working at making it better. And our first test of this team structure came on January 6th. So December 23rd, I'm thinking, okay, it's almost Christmas Eve. I'm going to take a few days off. I had not stopped moving once since November 13th. I mean, it was like a freight train. And I'm thinking, okay, Christmas Eve, tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a week off or something. My phone rings. Hi, this fellow says. I'm Doug, and I have a helicopter. And I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to help with this effort by getting media and politicians up in the air in my helicopter. And I'm like, yep, you're on, right? 
And so we meet on December 27th, so I did get three days off. And we, uh, with a kind of a, a, a core team of some of the team leaders, so we're just trying this out, right? It's only been in place since December 8th, or December 17th. And we decide on a date. Thank goodness we chose the date. It was the only non-foggy day in about a two-week stretch. It was quite amazing. <laughs> and between December 27th and January 6th, we put together a national media event. And the media who came out said to us, I've been to the Olympics, and you guys are more organized than they are. <laughs> right? I've been to official openings of major events, and your media kit is unlike anything I've ever seen. Right? And we were able to accomplish that because we worked as coordinated teams and everything was set aside other than the single goal of pulling this event together. We had the helicopter taking off all day long. We had politicians coming and going. We had media all day long. And we had 500 people on Stebbings Road. Coming and going you know, all day long. Coming and going all day long. It was, it was extraordinary. <laughs> The coverage, Globe and Mail, Global, CTV, Check, CBC, Times Colonist, The Province, CFAX, Focus Magazine, D Smog, Vice, and W5, who will be airing their show on Saturday, this coming Saturday. So the, the Margaret Mead quote of never underestimating a small group of determined people, um, we demonstrated that on January 6th. We demonstrated that None of us are being paid for what we're doing, right? We're all giving our time and our energy because of that environmental threat. And that, that fabric that it has woven around Seanigan, I would say, is revolutionary. Because it's, it's in it, it's creating something more beautiful in our community and it's creating bonds that will never go away and it's creating a capacity and empowerment of people at a time when I would say we have a, a, a democratic crisis and it's a community saying you know what we're, we're going to decide our future we're going to decide how this turns out no matter what the authorities or the powers to say we're going to decide. So that's that's the kind of um, the narrative of that weaving of the fabric and and the to, to January sixth. There was an event on Saturday, February twenty seventh. Takaya Blaney came. Mm -hmm. There were representations from uh, representatives from four First Nations, yeah. that right? as well as communities members of communities all up and down Cowichan and, and into here. And again, this idea of we can do this differently. Right? We can do this by coming together and we can do it in kindness and gentleness and love. Um, love for each other and love for the, the land and the water and the future. And I think that as long as we can stay there. So I'm going to end on one thing. I, I was watching a Bernie Sanders um, YouTube video just before I came and Bernie Sanders says change takes place because people struggle mm -hmm. and when you think about social environmental alliance we have so much to struggle for right now in terms of our environment and we have to come together in that struggle and it has to give us something beyond just fighting and it has to be about being together so I was going to show this one video. It's not the one that's been prompted, it's, and it's kind of, it, it just proves what I've said. It just, <laughs> um, this was made on the day, on the January 6th, the heli I call it Helicopter Day, um, and it speaks to what we could do. So, and then I can take questions, and then I'll carry This is a story that has played out over and over again across BC. 
We see government and industry decide an area is right for a toxic waste site or a pipeline or a smelter or a mine. Despite community opposition, the project gets pushed ahead. It's a battle of the powerful, the wealthy, the vested interests against the charming and idyllic town. Shawnigan Lake is one small town that is fighting back. Now the morning was gilded around the edge. So we've been working on this since 2012 with the community slowly growing aware and how urgent it is that we actually stop this thing. The government has had the authority to stop it. They have failed to do so. They have not listened to the community. They have only listened to the industrial lobbies that they've been accepting behind the scenes. Putting a contaminated landfill on a mountain at the headwaters of your drinking watershed above the lake that's the heart of your community is insanity. And we do not accept this in our community, and we never will. When we win, the site will have to be remediated. Those costs will be borne by every citizen of BC. Why further increase those costs? Put a stop to it. Let all the facts be heard by a judge. We understand it has to go somewhere, but a watershed doesn't make sense. The government is not listening to the people here. They're listening to the permit holders. It's time that the government represented people and not permit holders. That's why everyone's here today. That's why they were here yesterday. And that's why they'll be here again tomorrow. We don't want to lose our water, and we don't want to lose a beautiful place. We want to save our water. That's what this sign says, so, yeah. And a fresh set since blood in my ears. How far would you be willing to go to protect your community, to protect your water, to protect your kids? Corporations can outmaneuver, outspend, or outlawyer most communities in these kinds of battles, but the residents of Shawnigan Lake say they're not going away. What I would like to see is a proactive approach to dealing with any of our waste and with contaminated soil we need to collectively be looking for a place to put this stuff and it does not need to be at the top of a water, a drinking watershed that serves 12,000 people with drinking water. I'm not here representing the city of Port Moody but um, I'm here because I'm deeply concerned about the situation in Shawnigan Lake, about the contamination that's happening in this community and I, I feel that it's the responsibility of every elected official to participate in protecting our environment. In Shawnigan Lake, the community has said no to this project going forward for four years, but their opposition seems to be falling on deaf ears. So far, Minister Polak has not asked for the trucks to stop, but the community isn't giving up hope. How important do you think it was that uh, it was led by volunteers? I think it's it's everything. It, um, when the permit was issued in March, um, I, I remember saying to Calvin and to my, my husband, um, they're going to have to pay on their side, the government and the, the, the business. They have to pay for every lawyer's hour. They have to pay for every bit of effort going into this. We don't have to pay anything. And so we, we, are a, we are truly a renewable resource, right? <laughs> there's, there's no limit to the effort that we'll put in because we're not valuing it in dollars. And it's, it's the idea that um, how do you stand up against people that are willing to do this for free, right? In a world that, that bases everything in, in measuring costs, we don't measure it. We don't measure our efforts in anything other than it's the right thing to do. Their dollars were cents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So it's a, I, and I didn't talk about this yet because I was focused more on the community. But um, so the judicial review 
is was a, an, a basically a judicial review of the Environmental Appeal Board decision to uphold the permit. And that was launched by the Shawnigan Residents Association, the lawyers, and uh, they filed that review in May of 2015. And then in July, a document came out that showed a secret agreement between the company and the engineers. And I don't even want to go there because that's not what this is about. But um, So that review just wrapped up yesterday in the courts. Yesterday was the last day. It, it ended up being a 21-day hearing, all in all. And in the end, at the end of the hearing was the final bit on asking for a stay to, to stop the trucks. And the judge said he would be um, uh, expedite, he would expedite his decision on the stay, but reserve his judgment on quashing the permit or sending it back to the EAB. So we will hopefully, within a few weeks, within three weeks, we're hoping, have uh, a decision on the stay. And then once that's in place, again, I, I think the, the, the impact on the community will be enormous. I mean, it will just be like the greatest day ever. Happy dancing on the mountain. Yeah. It, um, and at the same time, we await a decision on the CVRD case. So the Cowichan Valley Regional District filed a petition in the Supreme Court basically saying that this landfill is not a permitted use on this, on this land. It's zoned F1 forestry. And when you go down the list of permitted use, contaminated landfill isn't on there. <laughs> uh, so it seems pretty straightforward, but hey. So that, that was supposed to be a five-day hearing. It turned into an 11-day hearing. Um, the other side's lawyers are really good at talking at length. Um, and so we're just waiting. And we don't know when that decision, I and mean, this is the thing, courts, you, don't, you never know when the decision's coming. So in an ideal world, we get a, a one, two, three. We get a stay. We get the CBRD case decision in our favor, and then we finally get, at which point, the judicial review decision um, isn't as, uh, you know, we wouldn't be waiting on tender hooks. All the judges that have looked at this case have acknowledged at some point that they will not be the last judges to look at this case, mm -hmm. that no matter the outcomes in these decisions, they're going to be appealed, right, either by our side or by their side. But... Yeah, that's the other avenue. I'm, you know, and that's in the hands of the lawyers. And um, for me, it's really important that the, the community piece, that's where my energy typically goes, is to into that. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the um, provincial approval and how that came about? Oh, that's a very, you know, this is, <coughs> so, so the, the, this has never been done before. This is an active quarry where they're blasting out rock. And instead of remediating the quarry in the end with residential fill, which is the, what they were supposed to do, they applied for this permit to fill it with contaminated soil while they're still actively blasting for the next 50 years. This is why, you know, you just think, well, that would never happen. Um, they're, they're, you know, it's funny, um, Bill Routley today was questioning Mary Polak on this issue in the house in, in uh, what's it called? Um, Estimate. Estimates. I, I can't listen to her answers anymore because I know them off by heart. <laughs> right? I could actually say them for her. Um, but she, she will say that the process has been fantastic, right? That you have a statutory decision maker, and in this case the <coughs> fellow's name was Hubert Bunce, and that he made his decision free of all political interference. Um, so basically he gets the application put in front of him with the technical assessment report from the engineers that have been hired by the company. This is the um, professional <coughs> reliance model in BC, which is, I mean, there's a, you know, I could go on all night, but there's, a, there's, a, there's layers and layers of issues here, right? And in some ways, I feel like Shawnigan is a test case for a lot of ideological decisions that have been made by this government. Mm -hmm. And that explains, for me, that helps explain why are they digging in so deep on this, right? Because politically, for the government, this isn't going well for them. 
this is not, this is not, you know. This is not going away. But they are steadfast that the process of applying for this permit, any application has to be considered, right? And you hand it off to this decision maker. He takes the information from the engineers that were hired by the company who say, of course, oh, this is great. You know, there's, uh, you know, 250 feet of impermeable rock, which there isn't. Um, and you, the process just seemed to have its own momentum from the very beginning. It's like the outcome was already set at the beginning, is how it seems to us, even from the Environmental Appeal Board point of view. And when you look at the Environmental Appeal Board, it's still an agency of the Ministry of Environment. So their job is not to particularly question decisions of the Ministry of Environment, it seems. It's more to, you know, to find ways that the Ministry of Environment was correct in their decision making. Um, the, ultimately, I think there are some very serious questions around how this government has shifted the responsibility for assessment of all manner of projects to be in the hands of the applicants mm -hmm. or in the hands of industry. Mm -hmm. And they have distanced themselves as, as taking responsibility for um, for the information, the science, and the facts. Yeah, it's very, it's a very, uh, the UVic environmental law has a fantastic report on professional reliance. And when you read it, it's like a playbook of what's happened in Shawnigan. Mm -hmm. Right down to the, the, they said, you know, you are creating um, the circumstances for conflict of interest here. Yeah. When, you, when you have industry hiring their own scientists, Obviously, those scientists are going to want to do what the people paying them are asking them to do, right? And so I think moving politically, moving forward, it is going to be incumbent on the opposition. I'm, I'm looking at Gary here. Um, it's going to be incumbent on making that a conversation in this next election about why have we handed the keys of the hen house over to the foxes, right? Yeah. And and how do we think that the outcome will be any different from what we see in Mount Polly, or any different from what we've seen in Shawnigan, or any different from any manner of, or any number of applications that are that just get streamlined through, right? So it's it's a it's a it's a much bigger issue on that front. Um, and, and I often want to go there in conversations and with media and try to lead them up to that place to see this in a, in a wider context. So, but again, because it was Social Environmental Alliance, I decided to focus on that community um, aspect. We also thought they'd be able to get away with it. Hubert Buds actually doesn't have the authority to um, rule on a contaminated soil site. He doesn't have the functions, powers, or the authority to roll in part four, which is the CSR, Contaminated Sites Regulations. Jennifer McGuire never gave him that authority. So the fact yeah. that he ruled on it and did this is completely and utterly illegal because well, this he doesn't is have the functions, powers, or authority. And of all the... Can you backtrack and tell me what those yeah, people's so roles were? Yeah, so I, I, I can do that. The, he approved the permit. He was the decision maker. He so was decision maker. Maker. And he was the director. Ministry of Environment, yeah. uh, 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 BC. Yeah. And he's not a just he's not a director. He keeps calling himself a director. He's not. He's a delegate for the director, Jennifer McGuire. No way. Yes way. No, <laughs> he's no. also the same guy that approved Mount Foley no, reopening no, too. No, it's still the province. <laughs> it's the province. It's the province. This is all ministers. Yeah. 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 And and. Uh, environment. Yes. Well, non environment. I call yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the title of. Yeah. <laughs> So according to the Ministry of Environment, it, um, the watershed, the Shawnigan watershed, uh, serves 12,000 people. So it's not just people drinking from the lake. Of course, the water flows south and then east through Mill Bay. So there's surface water. And there's also aquifers being fed from higher Shawnigan down to lower uh, Mill Bay and potentially Cobble Hill. There hasn't been a sufficient mapping of the aquifers. This is another very important aspect yeah, of this, is yeah. that the Souk Lake is the same distance from this site as Shawnigan Lake. It's five kilometers away, mm -hmm. and it's downhill. Mm -hmm. And it, we don't know 
what is happening underground in terms of movement of water. And the biggest issue with this site from the beginning, and this was uh, Dennis Lowen, the hydrogeologist, identified, you're putting a contaminated soil right on top of an aquifer. Mm -hmm. Not only right on top of an aquifer, but there's already groundwater at this site. They've already blasted below the water table. You know, oh. they, they have seen a lake, we call it. <laughs> and so <laughs> once the contaminants are entering into the groundwater, there's no way to say categorically all that groundwater is flowing eastward. Some of it might be flowing westward, yeah. right? Yeah. But nonetheless, I mean, it's groundwater. We need, um, this is, I've been working on the water and I'm reminding some of the I didn't see. And, and you know, we, in, back in the 90s, you know, I used to watch the forest go out and the Japanese cars come in. Now we've got forests going out and toxic soil coming in. Yeah. On top of it. Yeah. Okay, so my first question to you, I, I've never found out where this toxic soil is coming from. Who has provided the toxic soil? Okay. Where is it coming from? So that's a really good question because when, in the, in the sort of sales job for this, Mary Polak would say, we need a, a South Island site to serve Southern Vancouver Island. Well, the biggest load of soil so far has come from Port Moody, from Pacific Coast Terminals. Pacific Coast Terminals? Which is a sulfur terminal mm. in Port Moody. So the soil is very high in sulfur chlorides and sodium, mm -hmm. all things you want. Um, so it was barged from Port Moody to Nanaimo and then trucked from Nanaimo down to Shawnigan. So the notion that this was a local uh, contaminated s deposit site for southern Vancouver Island, the, the soil can come from anywhere. Right. There's no restriction. Right. Um, and my other concern around this is that if this is an experiment in um, how does the quarry, be, quarry business become more lucrative? Mm -hmm. So in Chehalis, the proposal that was brought forward was a quarry operator who's hauling out rocks out of um, up near Chehalis River. It's a long drive, right? He hauls out the rocks. Well, he's not making that much money because he's coming back with empty truckloads. So he's applied for a permit to haul back contaminated soil, mm -hmm. or as he calls it, remediated soil, <laughs> and to dump it right next to Chehalis River. So the local government there has turned down the, the land use application to be able to do that. But, I, you know, to me, I think, well, that, that's only your first step, guys. Like, do not put your guard <laughs> down. Um, you, and then there's a, another quarry in Nicola Valley um, that has applied for the same permit to bring in yeah. contaminated soil. It's, it's an ongoing the second point I want to make is you brought up the hydrologist. You know, we need a hydrologist too. We really need to band together on this. I, from my former life, my real life, I'm a plumber. And I understand quite a lot about water and what happens to it in the upstream and downstream and whatever. But I'm not a hydrologist, and there's no way that I could determine those things. I have been studying it, like, as best I can, because as much as I ask for help from whatever, from everybody, and I know there's got to be a hydrologist out there somewhere just waiting to be called on. Yeah. We really need this, because water is sovereignty. That's one of the things that I think is overlooked a lot by the like, people who are not in, like, in the know about how water and pipes and all these things work. As soon as they get that shit in the ground, as soon as they, it's not just precedence. It's not just precedence. All of these advantages, all of these incursions on our rights come through water, through floodplains, water lines, pipelines. These things are sovereignty. Yeah. As soon as they get control of this stuff, mm. then they can say, oh, you know what? It, it's screwed up. Now we got to go back in and fix it. Oh, well, you guys got to move. You got to move. You got to get your land because this is how it works. And it has been done over and over again. I've seen it back in Ontario. I've seen it throughout history. This is a sovereignty issue beyond the TPP, beyond the trades, things that are behind this. And I think you've already kind of started to suss out what the bigger picture is here. Right? Mm -hmm. you're kind of hedging around it, but I, I'm pretty sure you have an understanding of what I'm talking about. You know, the water, the water side of it is really very important. We really do need a hydrologist. We need one in the wall grant, and you guys need one up there. And we have to start really looking at this. And also where the contaminated soil is coming from, that also has to be really sourced out. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we are looking at the Mount Polly mine disaster. Yeah. They're opening the gates. Where do you think this water is going? It's going into the Fraser River. Where is that contaminated soil going to come from? Well, it's going to come out of the delta. 
Why do they want to do this? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, exactly. And not just the tankers in the harbor. I've been looking at the ocean floor, and before oh, I ever there. got into the wall run and got into the kind of shit that I'm in now, I was there on my own a year before the whole oh, thing happened. Okay. And the thing is, is that I, I saw the helicopter landing pads there, and I met the, the Texans who were up there. I knew this had more to do with the pipeline than it did with the forest yeah. even in that moment. And yeah. I looked at the I, I looked at the ocean floor outside of the Warburn River, the exact same outline <coughs> as the mud flats around Vancouver. I believe the reason they're going after that valley right now is because they want to put in a station there. Yeah. Why did they shrink the parks? Because they want to put in a station there. It would be a good place to do it. We're having a terrible time defending the Warburn. There's no community there. You guys talk about building community in Shawnigan and how great this has been for you. Uh, it's the exact opposite for me. Yeah. The harder I push, yeah, the harder true. my own people push back. This is very isolating. So yeah. You talk about having endless volunteer labor. I'm losing my home. Austin, anything? I'm losing everything. Right? Zero support. Nothing on the ground. We've been defending for 30 years. Something else that is remote to us. Yeah. And it's been a hard, hard struggle. I, I stood on the roads in the Walbrand in 1991. So I've, I've been, I know the Walbrand struggle. It's interesting. Um, the Senate Coast Terminals. I did some research over Christmas. It's owned by a company called Soltran. <coughs> Soltran's a conglomerate of 19 oil and gas companies. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Water. <coughs> Water. <coughs> Water. <coughs> I'm drinking out of the vase. <coughs> of the nine companies that sit on the board of Soltran combined, Thank you. <laughs> I, I can do this. Well, I understand <coughs> you're trying to bring, we're talking about bringing the soil up from the states. And what's this stuff coming from the Thank military you. base? Yeah, it's a good question. But the Sultran, the nine combined, <coughs> dear, contributed almost half a million to the Liberal Party in the last election. Mm -hmm. uh, Right, so you just start connecting the dots, right? How do you spell that? <laughs> I'm sorry, in, I'm really. I think I'm just. Speech, the, 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 uh, <coughs> the lieutenant governor talked a lot about how his responsibility to save the rest of the world from further coal development by liquid natural yeah. gas, and then <laughs> even tacked on at the end that, and by the way, BC invented the concept of social license. Like after laying out how we we're all going to take it. We're yeah. all going to give it, we're all going to take it. The sea is now responsible for the world's development and coal being used and blah, blah, blah. We're also yeah. shipping the coal. Yeah, well, it's got our yeah, sugar the and it just and shipping the asbestos. <coughs> okay, I, I should let Carolyn come up. Thank you for coming and for being interested. I hope that helped sort of give some context.